This video is brought to you by KEH, the re-commerce camera company. Not only is KEH the oldest and biggest at what they do, buying and selling exclusively used camera gear of all sorts since 1979, but they do it well with integrity and both a 180-day warranty and 21-day return policy, free shipping on transactions over 49 bucks. Which is why, because they make it as futz-free a process as possible, they are our go-to whenever we are looking to fund new purchases by selling our own gear or buying that special used piece of kit properly graded and checked when we want to go quirky or old school. Even better, beginning today, November 25th and running through the 29th, KEH's Black Friday Cyber Monday sale is on. Get a 10% bonus buying or selling site-wide at KEH.com using the special code HUE10. Thanks, KEH. What is the one advantage Sony enjoys over all other full-frame mirrorless camera systems? It is not autofocus. Uh, hold that thought. Nor is it the fact that Sony makes its own sensors. Uh, hold that thought. Rather, it is the breadth and depth of the lens ecosystem surrounding Sony's full-frame FE lens mount. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and you heard me right. Sony's singular advantage is not what most of us think. Rather, at this point, it's all about the glass. Lenses. Does Sony have the best autofocus in the business? Often, although depending on scenario, my personal experience is that sometimes Canon's autofocus is better. And from what I'm seeing in the first hands-on reports from other YouTubers about the Z9, it looks like Nikon's autofocus performance might just have caught up. Does Sony have the best sensors in the business? I think it's fair to say, yes, it does. Although it doesn't put its best sensors in every single one of its cameras, and it also sells its sensors to the competition. But yeah, okay, they do make all kinds of sensors, including smartphone sensors. They own something north of 40% of the sensor market, and they leverage their experiences with every segment in every other. In this regard, they are in fact unmatched. So, okay, the one other advantage Sony enjoys over every other mirrorless camera manufacturer out there, and the one I'm going to talk about today, is that there are simply more lenses available from more manufacturers for its FE mount than any other, including shockingly good, keenly priced third-party lenses. If you know which ones to buy. So let's get into what I think are the best bang for the bug lenses in the Sony full frame mirrorless ecosystem, only from among lenses with which I've actually had hands on experience. And let's begin with an honorable mention to Samyang slash Rokinon's Plastic Fantastic 450 buck 24 millimeter, 350 buck 35 millimeter, $400 45 millimeter, and $300 75 millimeter f1.8 primes. Now, I would not recommend these lenses to everyone, and I would not buy them for myself. In fact, I consider them starter lenses. They are devoid of the mechanical robustness and industrial design that lead to the kind of joy I experienced as a kid when first holding a Leica Sumar 5cm collapsible lens, or the very first interchangeable lens I bought with my own money, an all-metal and glass Canon FL 51.8. But don't let these things stop you. There is no denying that the Samyang Rokinon lenses are more than a low-cost introduction to very small, lightweight primes, easier to carry and capable of shallower depth of field than a 24-28 to 70 or 75 2.8 zoom. The good news, beyond their price, size, weight, and speed, is that they offer very real image quality improvements over the Plastic Fantastic 1.8s of a generation ago. They are a dramatic improvement over most older all-metal manual focus SLR lenses of the 60s, 70s, and even 80s, like that FL 51.8, and actually more than hold their own, thank you very much, against Canon's first generation, at least, 51.8 STM, as well as some of today's kit zooms. Consider them a real alternative to, at the very least, Sony's 28 to 70, 3.5 to 5.6 kit zoom, because moderately fast primes are a nice starting point for someone's first real ILC system. They are how he or she can learn about framing with one's feet, directing their intended audience's attention through the use of shallow depth of field, and being able to photograph quietly, unobtrusively, without schlepping. On the other hand, none of these Samyang Rokinon primes has image stabilization, although most lenses in these focal lengths don't. 
Only the 24 and 35 have any weather sealing. And because they are basically all plastic, they confound the thermal management design of even Sony's A7S III, which really makes them best suited for photography only. In the end, they receive an honorable mention because they are worthy of consideration for yourself if primes are your thing and you want to travel especially small, light, fast, and inexpensively, or as a starter set for someone whose appetite for photography is something you wish to encourage. You can also start with just the 45 1.8, which I found to be smoother and quieter to autofocus, interestingly enough, than Sony's own $250 FE 50 1.8. Now, we will address primes when you don't demand that speed because 2.8s can be much more useful than one might imagine. But let's finish up our exploration of 1.8 primes for now with Viltrox's 85 1.8. It is a keenly priced autofocusing portrait lens, just 400 bucks, that I suspect you'll keep much longer than that low price might imply. In my time with it, I found the Viltrox offered surprisingly good image quality. build quality, and feel in hand. I enjoyed using it. Its autofocus performance was not quite up to Sony's own $600 85 1.8, and it was as good or better, to my surprise, than our image-stabilized $1,250 Zeiss Battis 85 1.8. More importantly, in the real world at normal viewing size and distances, 99% of us, 99% of the time, wouldn't be able to see any difference in IQ among the three lenses, IS or not, especially when coupled to an IBIS-equipped body, and all of Sony's full-frame bodies are so equipped. The Viltrox doesn't have the extra controls of the Sony or the OLED panel of the Zeiss, and it did show occasional chromatic aberration, though that particular CA was easily manageable for stills, especially at the price. And neither the Sony nor Zeiss were immune from chromatic aberration either. I say that Viltrox is a company to watch. Let's continue with 2.8 primes, though zooms are coming, hold that thought too, because at that point, there are no differences in depth of field between them, the value proposition shifting to questions of flexibility, size, weight, and price. Now, most of you watching this probably already know about Tamron, but I was shocked last year by how crispy and tasty their $200, 215 gram 24, and 210 gram 35 2.8 DI3 OSD primes were in my testing. No IS, anodyne industrial design with equally uninspiring materials, and no joy in shooting. Sometimes more distortion and chromatic aberration than I'd like, but wow, superb sharpness and some weather resistance in a small, very lightweight package, though not quite as small or lightweight as the Samyang Rokinons with images that can be easily corrected in post most of the time. In fact, one of my favorite shots during the worst days of the pandemic, this one, was taken with the 24-2.8. Tamron also makes a couple of really impressive zooms. Their $1,400, 1.7 kilo, 150 to 500, F5 to 6.7 is neither small nor light, but it is an excellent super tele zoom for our primary use case, urban landscape. It made our 12 megapixel A7S III credible as a stills camera with images like this. It also impressed with its design and build quality. It did not look or feel like what, in my previous experience, Tamron lenses feel and look like. It was rock solid and well finished. It reminded me of a Sigma. The real treat is that the 150 to 500 is marginally lighter, significantly less expensive, and gives up little to nothing in terms of IQ fit and finish to Sony's $2,000, 2.1 kilo, slightly greater reach at the long end, FE 200 to 600, F 5.6 to 6.3. Differences in maximum aperture, nothing to write home about. Autofocus performance, I didn't notice any in our testing, but then again, urban landscape doesn't stress test AF. Both were very quick and sure. But with this said, it is Tamron's $900, 540-gram, 28-75, 2.8 version 2 that is the real buy in Tamron's zoom lineup. It is so small, light, sharp, and fast to focus. It worked really well with the pre-production Sony a7 IV I had on hand to use with it as well as our a7S III that it began to warp my sense of what a street photography set up can be. Which, being the prime kind of guy that I am, is saying something.
compared to Sony's $2,200, 886 gram, 2040, 72.8 G Master. It is a steal, stills or video. And I am this close to picking up one for myself. I do have a couple of other things ahead of it in my purchase queue, like Apple's new MacBook Pro M1 Max for video editing. Though, speaking of video, I saw no significant difference between the two lenses in terms of image quality, autofocus performance, or focus breathing here in the Batcave shooting at 4K. Both lenses are excellent, and this would be our primary use case for it. It blows the otherwise lovely little Sony G50 f2.5 out of the water for focus breathing control. Lovely as it is, the 52.5 breathes like a dragon. A not unimportant consideration for us given that Sony's new software-based focus breathing control coming out on the a7 IV of course, does not work with the 52.5, among others. And for just $300 more than the 52.5 alone, you've got a much more flexible package for everything from street photography to portraiture, product shots, landscape, event, and gimbal work. In other words, unless Sony comes out with an incredibly compelling version 2 of that G Master that makes it worth more than twice the price of the Tamron, this is a no-brainer. Get the Tamron, full stop, stills, or video. Though, Tamron, could you please, please make sure the EXIF data for your lenses includes the word Tamron in it? The absence of the brand identifier just makes it a bit more tedious when doing testing comparisons. Next up, Sigma. I think it's fair to say that Sigma offers image quality, build quality, feel in hand, and industrial design for less as a package unmatched by any other third-party lens manufacturer or Sony itself primes and zooms. I am a big fan. Although, notice I omitted autofocus performance. Hold that thought. When it comes to primes for photography, Sony's new G series are very close competitors to Sigma's I series, and both are next level compared to anything I've had in hand from Tamron, Samyang, Rokinon, Viltrox, and others. In fact, as many of you may know, I own that Sony 52.5. The Sony's and Sigma's are compact, beautifully sharp, better corrected than, and equipped with aperture rings absent from the Tamron, Samyang, Rokinons, and Viltroxes, though none are equipped with IBIS. The Sony's and Sigma's offer familial industrial design worthy of respect, and both lens lines are priced in the $550 to $700 range. I do prefer Sigma's I-Series for my personal street work, however. They are every bit as optically tasty, with sometimes marginally superior chromatic aberration correction, but also offer design, feel, fit, and finish that I think are superior to the Sony's, that is the new G lenses I've just mentioned. The Sigma's are heirloom level in my book. The Sony G's I just mentioned are not. Sigma's I series is also far more complete with their 640-24 F2, 550-24 3.5, $640-35 F2, $550-45 2.8, $700-65mm F2, and $640-90 2.8 already on the market. If you don't need your 24 to be as fast as 24s can get, both Sigma 24s are bargains compared to Sony's larger, heavier, $1,400 but utterly brilliant 1.4. You have to ask yourself, how often do I shoot or need to shoot with an aperture that bright? At the longer end, if you don't need macro capability, I prefer Sigma's diminutive I-Series 92.8 to Sony's much larger and heavier, but razor sharp, image stabilized $1,100 92.8 macro. I used to own a Sony 92.8, but it's maybe the only lens I've ever owned which actually did feel too clinical to me. And the AF was a bit slow and noisy. Though, make no mistake, it is indeed optically superb. But the Sigma 92.8 is so tasty, small, and light, just 295 grams, that it makes me happy and gives me images like this. On the other hand, Sony and Tamron lenses are generally, if sometimes only marginally, more consistent when it comes to autofocus. This is most notable for me right here in the Batcave for video, though one could argue as we now shift to Sigma zooms that the Sigma 24 to 72.8 autofocus is slightly more cinematic. And I'd agree with you. Though when it comes to IAF, I have noticed that even when shooting stills, the Sony's and Tamron's generally edge out the Sigma's for speed and consistency consistently. Thus, unless you need 10 tenths autofocus, like Tamron's 28 to 75 G2.8 G2, 
Sigma's 24 to 72.8 is a no-brainer compared to Sony's twice the price G Master. It's not nearly as clear when compared to the Tamron directly, especially given Sigma's own smaller, lighter, and less expensive 470 gram $800 28 to 72.8. I'd give the nod to the Sigma 24 to 72.8 over its younger brother and the Tamron when a wider field of view at the short end matters more to you than the slightly narrower field of view at the long end. But I'd have to give the nod to the Tamron over both when 10 tenths autofocus or the extra five millimeters at the top end is most important, the Sigma 28 to 72.8 when weight is the most important. I've already gone over Tamron's Super Telephoto zooms, but Sigma is right there with its 950 buck 1.135 kilo 100 to 405 to 6.3 and $1,500 2.1 kilo 150 to 605 to 6.3 DGDN contemporary lenses. The 150 to 600 is a big boy, especially when fully extended. I found it required a gimbal head. Shockingly, my Arca Swiss ball head being insufficient to the task alone within spitting distance weight wise of Sony's 200 to 600, but still coming in for 500 less. It offers a wider bottom end than the Sony, and while it is clearly the value winner between the two, I'd give the edge to the Sony for sports and wildlife autofocus performance. Then again, for what we do, the 150 to 600 is more than enough, though I might give up the additional top end for Tamron's 150 to 500, given its more compact dimensions and the inclusion of a tripod foot, something which is a $90 accessory for the Sigma, and it's just one more thing to futz with. I also prefer the Tamron 150 to 500 for ultimate reach over Sigma's 100 to 400, but the 100 to 400 is significantly less expensive and more compact, easily fitting inside my Peak Design 20 liter backpack. On the other hand, it will be harder for many of us to choose Sony's $2,500 1.4 kilo 100 to 400 G Master over the Sigma's or Tamron's, unless one must absolutely have the one additional stop and again, 10 tenths autofocus performances. The Sony 100 to 400 is quite extraordinary. I found differences among them in sharpness, essentially splitting hairs, although I would give the nod to that Sony if ultimate IQ were the goal and budget were a non-issue given the Sony's superior chromatic aberration control. Before I wrap this up, I do want to mention a few other budget options. First, I was pleasantly surprised by TT Artisans, manual focus only, $235, 51.4 in Sony FE mount. It is a Chinese homage to the Leica Sum Lux M51.4 for one twentieth the price with build quality, even image quality that may well surprise you with images like this. If you are into tiny manual focus glass, you should take a look. You might also take a look if you want to go super wide at Laowa's $720 9mm f5.6. I wouldn't quite call this a bargain lens, nor is it the sharpest tool in the shed, but it is unique and capable of images like this. The closest you can get to this field of view in FE mount, of which I'm aware anyway, is with Sony's own 12 to 24 millimeter F4, but that's an $1,800 lens. Finally, there are budget bargains even within the Sony lineup, including a number of lenses I've already mentioned, like their $600, 371 gram, 85 1.8, especially when compared to its older brother, the $1,800, 820 gram, 85 1.4 G Master, which we named our 2016 lens of the year, as I recall, and those new moderately spec but highly performant $600 a pop G series primes, as long as you're not concerned about focus breathing, as I've already mentioned, and the occasional chromatic aberration. Depending on what else you need, I'd also take a look at used copies of the Sony Zeiss 55 1.8, generally available from around 600 bucks in excellent condition versus a thousand new. Sony's newer FE 35 1.8, generally available for 600 bucks as well in excellent condition versus 750 new. Or Sony's 70 to 200 millimeter F4, generally available from around 1100 in excellent condition versus 1500 new, almost one third the price of Sony's just released $2,800 second generation 70 to 200 2.8. That's it for now, though you may have your own favorites, and I encourage you to share them with the rest of us in the comments section below. I'd say the two Tamron zooms I've mentioned are the most compelling of the zooms to me, the Sigma i-Series, the most compelling of primes. I, in fact, own most of the i-Series lenses for my Leica SL2, though 
Okay, Sigma is 24 to 72.8. Yeah, that speaks to me as well because it is optically and mechanically superb. And I really do like Sony's 70 to 200 F4. And if money is no object, I've never seen a better 24 1.4, 35 1.4, or 135 1.8 than Sony's. In fact, I've never seen a lens in any of these configurations at any price as good. But that's just me. Your mileage may vary, and that's fine. The overarching point, as I asserted at the beginning and close with now, is that no other manufacturer in the full-frame mirrorless space has as wide and performant a set of native mount lens options as Sony's FE mount at attractive prices. And I encourage you to take advantage of that fact. This video was brought to you by KEH. KEH's Black Friday Cyber Monday sale is on. Get a 10% bonus buying or selling site-wide at KEH.com using the special code HUE10. Thanks, KEH. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no cost to you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.